Well, here I am. I have arrived in Washington, D.C. I'm beginning a new Ph.D. in liturgy. And uh, behind me is the Basilica here, the National Shrine. And I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about something that is essential to why I'm here. Uh, why would I come to D.C. to study liturgy and sacramental theology? Um, as a Christian, I believe in theology. I believe that there are certain words I can say about God. That's what theology means. Uh, theologia, a word about God. Now the reason that Christians speak words about God more so than most other faiths is because they believe that in the person of Jesus Christ, God made a revelation of himself. Uh, and that revelation was communicated in the universal language of flesh and blood. But because that universal language uh, of flesh and blood is understood in different languages and cultures and people, uh, making sure that that central revelation, the incarnation, the person of Jesus Christ, is preserved, making sure that that message is handed on, that that tradition is brought forward to the next generation is very important. We believe that God is most powerfully seen in a particular rather than in something obscure. Although we affirm that God is transcendent, we also believe that he has made himself eminent. And so we do theology. This is where doctrine and dogma come from. They're rooted essentially in the affirmation that in the person of Jesus Christ, we can know God in a powerful way. Now, as Christian history has progressed, sometimes the way that dogma is understood, or at least the way that it's uh, presented, has shifted as Christianity has come into different cultures, has encountered different worldviews, and has been brought into different times, it has developed new ways of talking about the Incarnation. Uh, we say that Christ is a member of the Trinity, but the Trinity is not a term that you find in the Bible. We talk about Christ using terms like uh, one in being with the Father in the Nicene Creed, but that sort of language is more Hellenistic than the original Hebrew worldview in which Christianity was first born. How do we excuse the development of Christian doctrine in the light of affirmation that Christianity is about preserving a single revelation? Well, that is a very difficult question if you believe that Christianity is static, but we don't. We believe that Christianity is a living thing, that the, the core of Christianity uh, might be found in a, a seed that's planted in the ground, and when the seed is planted, uh, it will grow in different ways depending on the different cultures and environments that it encounters. So if I took a seed that I found here amongst these trees and I, I planted it on top of a high hill with lots of sunlight, it would grow one way. If I planted that same seed in a valley with lots of water, it would grow another way. Christianity is all about learning how to present the same life in an environment where it's able to be communicated the most effectively. If Christianity did not address cultures and people, did not address worldviews and philosophies in a terminology that was tangible to the people, then the, the powerful message of the incarnation that God has been made tangible would be obscured by ethnocentrism, by sexism, by uh, chronocentrism all sorts of things that would limit it. 
And in fact, many times in Christian history, the church has uh, been least life-giving in the times when it has held on to uh, its own previous expressions rather than allowing the central truth, the central reality of the Incarnation to grow anew in a new context. So there's lots of examples of how this happens. And anytime Christianity enters a new culture and a new worldview, it does not, uh, it does not adopt the culture wholesale or adopt the worldview wholesale. It does not allow God to be contained by the culture or the worldview, but rather it uses the language and the terminology to point to God, but usually in the process it winds up uh, coming to a point where the worldview has to be shattered in order to express something about God. So for example, uh, we have in the Nicene Creed, as I mentioned before, the idea of Christ uh, being the same essence as the Father. To have Christ be the same essence as the Father, that incorporates Hellenistic terminology in order to express the reality of the indwelling life of God, that God and Christ share that life, that it affirms that we serve a God that's not a black hole of love, but rather uh, is self-giving in love. If we, if we didn't affirm the relational aspect of that God, that he would, he would become a narcissist that needs all love to point to him. But because we affirm that God uh, is in his very nature community, then we can affirm that God's life is outflowing and it's outgiving. But to affirm the centrality of God, uh, as that divine simplicity that the Hellenists wanted, they used the term one essence. That, that Christ and the Father share the same essence, the same being. But that shatters the cosmology that it's presented. You can't have two things that share those things. So it, it both addresses the worldview and then shatters it. Another example of this might be the uh, development of the terminology surrounding the Lord's Supper. Uh, church, the church developed this phrase, transubstantiation. Now, transubstantiation uh, relies on Aristotelian terminology, substance and accidents, in the way that it's generally formulated. Now, this could potentially make people think that the church has dogmatized Aristotelianism, that somehow, uh, the only way to understand God is to hold an Aristotelian worldview. But that is not the point. The point is that the doctrine is it being expressed uh, in the lens of the, the, the milieu that it finds itself in. But it transcends it. In this example, we have uh, the, the essence of something and the accidents, the substance and the accidents. Uh, so this, the substance of communion is Christ, but the accidents are bread and wine. This idea shatters the Aristotelian cosmology, but it uses the phrases that are inherent in the language of expressing that worldview in order to demonstrate that God is beyond that. Let me explain. So, if I was an Aristotelian, I would believe that my, uh, my substance informs my accidents. So you can look at me and you see that I have fingers and uh, I have a head and uh, you know my, my skin is on my body. These things are all accidents of what my substance is as a human being, as a person. Uh, the essence or the, the substance basically creates the expression of the accidents. In the case of transubstantiation, it doesn't compute. The substance is one thing, but the accidents don't flow from it. It actually shatters the entire cosmological formulation. 
So over and over we see that as new challenges are brought up, as new perspectives, new worldviews, uh, Christianity changes, but it changes so that it might stay the same. It doesn't change in order to pander to new worldviews, but in order to evangelize, to bring the good news into that context. It's a beautiful thing. So when people talk about how Christianity has changed, keep in mind, it does so in order that it might stay the same.